the Pastor David Roman. Put your hands together for Pastor David Roman. <laughs> so, thanks for being here tonight. My name is Chris Alessi. I get the incredible honor and privilege of calling myself the young adult pastor here at Metro Life Church. I also get to operate in uh, the campus pastor role of our Doral location. And up here on the platform with me is Pastor David Roman, a member of our team here. If you've ever watched an online service at Metro Life, especially during quarantine, you've probably interacted with Pastor David and his wife. But even cooler than that is that back when I was in high school and then my first like two years of college, you and your wife led the young adult ministry here at Metro Life Church. It was called Sigma Gamma Pi like before. Back in the day. Back in the day. And then Way we called back it. Back in the day. <laughs> then we called it Relate. Relate. We were because, trying to be cool and hip and cutting edge. And that was when one word like young adult youth ministries were like one word. And we were yeah. just trying to find that one word. Like fusion. That, that one word. You know those ones that make you now be like, what are they? Who are they? Who are, are they? they? What are, are they a smoothie place? Yeah. I don't understand. Well, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, one of the reasons that I've asked Pastor David to be with us here tonight is because, you know, Stephanie and I were talking about it the other day, about how we would love to start getting into these forums where we're just having real dialogue, taking our time, not feeling rushed, getting away from some of the, the typical service environments and having some dialogue. So tonight we're actually going to have some dialogue. And when I was talking to Stephanie, she was like, you know, you should, you should really talk to Pastor David about it. And the minute she said that, I went back to all of the theological discussions that you and I have had, some just in passing, where I'm like, Pastor David, hey, I had this thought. Or sometimes you would analyze one of my old sermons and be like, I have a thought for you. And we just go back and forth, sometimes on the exact same page. Sometimes, same page, but different perspectives. And so I thought it would be really, really cool tonight to talk about some things together. So I want to thank you for being here. Guys, please help me welcome Pastor David Roman. Very glad you are here. Before we get started, would you like to say anything? Sure. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I sent a picture to the uh, cool technology people in the back. And uh, can you put a picture up? No. Yeah, I, I want to show I'm, off my family for a little bit. Oh. I so, misread that moment. Uh, if you can tell, I, I have an adoptive daughter. Uh, both of them are actually adopted, um, though they both look amazingly beautiful like their mama right there. That's my wife, Paola. Uh, we were high school sweethearts. We dated uh, throughout high school, throughout college. And uh, I, conned her, I mean, convinced her to marry me. Um, best day of my life. Uh, Karis is my oldest daughter. And Dawn, she's my firecracker. She's the one that's going to make my hair turn white and keep me young forever and ever and ever. And... Uh, I know very little about them except for uh, Karis is half Nicaraguan, half something else. Don is half Haitian, half something else. Uh, we were foster parents and uh, became adoptive parents. And uh, I give a big shout out to my pastor, Pastor Steve, because he took me to a, a Starbucks right over here. And uh, he kicked my butt one day and said, hey, I think God wants you to be a dad. And uh, have you ever considered maybe adopting kids? Because at the time, my wife and I were dealing with infertility issues. And uh, he was man enough to call me out on my pride issues. And uh, I have a life debt to him because of his boldness to speak into me. I have this beautiful family. So uh, that's my family. I thought, I thought you, you said a picture of maybe one of the old days when I was 17 or 18 years old. That's kind of where I Come thought on, were CJ. Going. We're not going to go back there. <laughs> because... I did that to Gabby a couple of weeks ago when I preached for youth. So the minute you're like, I've got a picture, I'm like, no. No, I don't have. Hey, do you have that picture of when Chris, Pastor Chris was 13 and no, we're playing? No, we don't. No, we're, I we're have, not doing I that. have plenty of those. We're not Just doing that. Avoid my Facebook at all costs if you enjoy uh, life with your eyes. Um, but honestly, Pastor David has been a part of our church for as long as I can remember. Um, has really sowed into to so many and, you know, when it really comes to the heart behind what we're trying to do, I, I don't know if there was much better than Pastor David. Right now in the young adult ministry, we're really looking to get more relational. We're, we, we've, we've built up leaders for the past five years, and we're looking to really release them. Um, once Pastor David and his wife transitioned out of young adult ministry, 
there was really a long gap. There, there was a couple of years where if you were a young adult at Metro, you came to church on Sundays, that's what you did. Um, and for a while, we, we watched that demographic, that demographic kind of disappear. So uh, my, once we had kind of grown the youth group after about five years, we decided to branch into young adult ministry. And I transitioned the youth ministry, went into young adults, and it's been amazing. I mean, to think that we have this many people, like, barely really even posting about it, when last week you heard that we're really doing more connect groups now is just incredible. And so we're, we've built these leaders up, and we're looking to really release them. The reason we're looking to really release them, and what we mean by that is we want to give people their Mondays to go and lead connect groups, to go and, and take what they're learning, to take what Metro offers, what the Bible offers, and lead connect groups. And then we will do events like this one. We will just plan them accordingly on what day we find works. But we want to be getting into a, a, a routine of meeting with people and doing life with people. Number one, because I don't know how long this information can last, but I know relationships last. And we're supposed to be giving our life to the eternal. We're supposed to be sowing seeds of the eternal. And so we want to make sure that we're focusing on those connect groups. At the same time, we do want to start looking at how can we be the biggest influence? And we really do believe that's, that's going to more people and not asking them to come here. You know, most of the life-changing conversations I've ever had happened over a table like this one. They weren't sermons. They were, they were life-changing conversations one-on-one. -on -one. And so for you to not know that that's what we're doing, but to tell that story of Pastor Steve, look at what one coffee does. This is why we are really looking to get into connect groups. And I know that there's really, I'm telling you, when someone at Metro is really going through it, really going through it, we connect them with Pastor Dave. We, we, we know that him and his wife, Paola, they are the ones. They, number one, if you're going to get married and you want a pastor at Metro Life Church to marry you, you're going to go through this guy. They, are, they, they lead premarital. They have the hard discussions with, with, with engaged couples. But when someone's really hurting and they need a real good counselor, I'm telling you, that, that lane goes through Pastor David. So many of us in the real areas of our life, the deep areas, are influenced by Pastor David. And so I thought while we're having these discussions that we would, we would just talk and we would, we would probably see if there was some room to get into discussions. But looking at the time, if we don't have time for that, we don't have time for that. And just continuing to let this dialogue go. So Pastor David, you and I have talked a little bit about what we'd like to get into. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and just pray, get us started. Actually, would you like to pray? Pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to just sit here across the table with not only another pastor, but my friend. I thank you for Christopher's life. I thank you that uh, tonight I count myself blessed to be surrounded by an amazing group of young adults. And though I might not know all of their names, I know their hearts because they're in this house, they're in this space. And so I, I pray a blessing over everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, I thank you that tonight they are here by divine appointment. It's not chance, it's not happenstance, it's not coincidence. Holy Spirit, I believe that you destined them to hear a word tonight that is going to start something inside of them. Something is going to be deposited, planted. A seed is going to take root tonight that is going to influence not just their tomorrow, but their future, their legacy, their destiny. So I pray for them. I may not know their names, but I know their heart because they're here tonight. So I pray for them specifically. And in the spirit tonight, I pray, God, that you would have your reign. Use the conversation that Pastor Chris and I have. You break down the walls and you open every door that needs to be opened so that people can hear your truth. It's in your son's master's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you even heard Naomi as she spoke during worship that it's a very chaotic world these days. And with that chaotic world, I actually believe it's just about as chaotic as it's always been. It's always chaotic. Social media just happens to really compound that and make you feel like that's what's going on all the time. But if you find, if you get off social media, the world's actually not on, on fire. But uh, you and I have been talking about how we engage with the world as Christians. What does that mean? What should we be getting involved in? What should we not be getting involved in? You know, last week I talked about how one of the fundamental points of the Bible is that those who are in a relationship with Christ should be slow to speak. Yet we have this narrative today that the way we fix things, the way we help is we're quick to react. 
and everything is reaction based and it's like well that kind of doesn't go in line so it all you know we've been talking about how to engage with the world as christians we have the answers they do not how we engage with the world is very important and we're not just talking about the fleshly desires we're talking about people that don't know god how should we be engaging with those people so right off the jump i told you i would tell the story but i'm gonna actually save it uh, how wh what are your thoughts these days on what's going on and how we as christians should be engaging with the world so i know i see a lot of uh, note takers and if you're not a note taker then i invite you to take your, your phone out and become a note taker tonight um, just because uh, your brain uh, will lie to you and convince you that you're going to remember something you hear tonight but uh, a note will will last a lot longer um, i'll say this it's very easy as a, as a believer in Christ to think that because you have this incontrovertible truth that you have the authority and ability to speak into every situation and circumstance with certainty. And I'll say this, you do have the incontrovertible truth, but there are two ways to be right. And I, I would say there is... There's the right way to be right, sure. and there's the wrong way to be right. Yeah. And so tonight, what I hope our conversation kind of exposes is the right way or the better way to be right. And I hope that piqued your curiosity. It piqued mine because you didn't say that on any of our phone calls. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear where that has to go. Um, well, then why don't we talk about the wrong way a little bit? Let's go into it. Um, you know, when I went to Bible college, I did one year, Lakeland, Florida my very first teacher in Bible college. It was supposed to be like English 110C or 1101 NC, 1101, whatever it is. Clearly I paid a lot of attention. You paid a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of attention. Um, well, he, he, I remember he like goes through all the syllabus on day one. When he's done going through the, actually, I'm sorry, I missed the important part of the story. He gives us a passage. First thing he does is on our desks are a little piece of paper and printed on the piece of paper, it's just like a little passage. It was clear that he just photocopied a small book, a, a Bible-sized book. And so he put it on our desk, and he's like, hey, everyone read it and tell me where you think it's, it's from. So we're reading it, and it's blessed are these, blessed are those, you know, these kind of things. Blessed is he who, you know, all those things. And so we're all young 18-year-olds 18 who are probably approaching the world that we have this What's the word you used in what? Truth in kind of a, a, a truth? Incontrovertible. In a convertible truth. <laughs> um, and we're approaching everything with certainty. And so we all start saying Matthew. We say John. Some says first Peter. So we're all going around, throwing this around, right? Well, he doesn't answer us. He just goes, okay, great. Let's move on. And he goes through the entire syllabus. When the syllabus was completely done, he goes, great, everyone's got their syllabus. We're like, yes. He goes, rip it up. Rip up the syllabus. He goes, that won't be your textbook. You won't have any tests. You're not going to do anything that that syllabus says. I just have to do that so I don't get sued by the school. But we're not doing anything there. All we're going to do is read this book. And he gave us a book about this big. And it was called The Art of Conversation. And literally, he then goes into like a 15-minute lecture about how the world is forgetting how to have conversation. This is 2010. There's nothing new under the sun. This is not a new problem. The world does not know how to have conversation. They only know how to debate. And so we're sitting there and we're like, oh, okay, whatever, whatever. And then he goes, all right, well, that's our time today. You know, we'll see you guys on Wednesday. We all start to pack up and as we do, it was like a movie. As we do, he goes, oh, by the way, that passage is not in John, it's not in Matthew, it's not in 1 Peter, it's actually not in the Bible at all. It's actually the opening chapter of the Quran. He said, I'm not trying to tell you that that book has truth in it, because we as Christians know you can't be kind of true. You're either all of truth or you're not. The Bible is all truth. He said, I'm not trying to convince you that there's some truth in things you haven't been exposed to. But I am letting you know, if you ever sit across from a Muslim, there's more you agree on than you think. And so all I know is that class taught me that there is a wrong way to converse with the world. Coming to the table with what I know we don't agree on 
rather than the right way would be coming to the table saying, there's common ground at this table. And we should probably start there because a brother offended is not easily won. Why would I come to the table looking to offend? So that's, that's what I would kind of present for the wrong way versus the right way. But what do you mean by the right way versus the wrong way? Yeah, so if I was taking notes, I, I would have written that down because that was bomb. I would have <laughs> written that down like and put stars and highlighted it in circles. In fact, I would have tweeted it and given you credit one time and then subsequently tweeted it again tomorrow and just taken credit for it myself. <laughs> that one um, time you were at Southeastern. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you are taking notes, I, I, want, I had this thought during worship, and I, I want you to write it down. And you can take full credit for it. Ready? Right. This, this is the thought. Ready? Our desire should be that when somebody is in trouble, we help them according to their need. I'll say it again for impact and emphasis. Our desire should be that when somebody is in trouble, we help them according to their need. So the wrong way to approach a conversation to what you are saying is that when we see an injustice or we see something that is stated that we know for a fact is an untruth, in other words, a lie, that we go guns blazing and we call out that lie for what it is, a lie. Because we're a Christian and we have all authority under heaven and earth to call out uh, a lie as a lie. We can do that. Yeah, you can do that. But you know what you just also did? You've lost the end to have a meaningful conversation into someone's world. Someone who's, who's posting an idea, and, and let's just go with social media. If someone is posting an idea on social media, a lot of times I find that they're posting an idea, one, because they're looking for validation. And not necessarily because they're looking for confirmation. And there's a difference especially in the demographic that I find in this room right now. There's a lot of people searching for the right truth. And you young person who's a believer in Christ, you have the right truth. So if you're surrounded by people who are searching for validation and you come in guns blazing and you knock them a little off kilter, then you've lost the opportunity to start a conversation that would help them find the ultimate truth. You got to stop saying great stuff very quickly because it takes me longer to say great stuff and then I feel like I'm robbing the microphone. But that's, that's incredible because, you know, you said some things. You talked about whenever we see injustice. This room thought about something very specific when you said that. Very specific when you said that because of what's been going on in the world today. But do you know how careful we got to be defining a word like injustice based off our current experience? We got to be very mindful that there's been injustice for every area in life forever. And so when you say we can't come in guns a blazing, we're not just talking about, you know, areas where we might be right or we think we're absolutely right. We have to approach these things on both sides of what would be the discussion on injustice today recognizing that there's a lot more to the word injustice. There's a lot more to what's going on than we could possibly imagine. So I remember watching an episode of The Crown, believe it or not. I've not watched the show. Rochelle and I will start very soon. But I happened to be around um, my sisters when they were watching an episode. And it was one of the later episodes where the queen was, was much older. And Billy Graham was on the TV. And... Her sister made some older lady is watching a young Billy Graham communicate. And she said, and I don't agree with her, but she said, such certainty on such a young man rubs me the wrong way. Simply because it's like, I guess in her mind, her age, his age, should have brought about more humility in her mind. And that cut her off from what he was saying. Now, that's not his fault. But if we do have the perfect truth, 
we should all be mindful when we're posting on social media, when we're doing, whenever we're doing anything. We should be mindful of a certain aspect of humility, no matter what side we're coming on. Because the truth is, there's a world running around defining things today to mean what our experience has been over the last year. But there are people who have lived in this world much longer than us. People who have been through things much worse than us. And we've got to be careful coming in guns a-blazing, thinking that the words I'm using mean and only mean these things. When to the general population, we don't know what those words carry. And so I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not an age thing, but it's a, I should approach every conversation from a humble place, not because I just might be wrong, but because the desire is to help this person, not win the argument. Is that correct? Yeah, that is totally correct. And I want to say this to amplify what you're saying. And is it all right if I, if I, if I quote scripture? Is that okay if we do that in church? Can, can, I, can I do that? Okay. Uh, there's this book in the Bible, in the Old Testament. That's the part before Jesus. All right? I don't, want to take, I don't want to take it for granted. Jesus kind of shows up in Christophanies uh, in the Old Testament. The Christophany is just the presence of Jesus, the person of Jesus in the Old Testament before Jesus is Jesus. Um, when I got to preach, uh, which was very few because pastor would always yell at me saying, David, you, you got to keep it like here. Stop going here in the way you talk. Um, <laughs> it's not that I don't appreciate preaching. I love preaching. I just appreciate more the teaching aspect of communications. Um, so I always love to be able to go into the Old Testament and, and talk about, like, what Jesus was preaching about. So in the book of Jonah, I think in the back, I, I asked them to, to find two verses for me. So the first one was, was Jonah chapter 1. And reading from the message. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to let you know in a little secret. I never preach from the message. So I'm not preaching tonight. I'm teaching, and I'm showing a thought, okay? So I'm not being contradictory to my own philosophy. <laughs> just being very specific, all right? So uh, I don't know if it's on the screen. Um, here we go. So one day, long ago, God's word came to Jonah. I meet his son. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way, and I can't ignore it any longer. So this is the message. Get your body up and go. And go talk to these people because they're in a bad way. Okay? This is the message. Can I tell you that same message applies today to the world we're in? Because we are surrounded by people who are in a bad way. And if people are in a bad way, it's the heart of God to so the quote that I asked you to write down earlier to encourage us, to impress upon us, to get up and go to them. Right? Uh, we're going to skip over the story of Jonah because I'm not preaching. I, I just want to show you a thought and go to the very last uh, chapter 4, the very last, the very last verse of, of chapter 4, uh, verse 11. All right? And I, I want to share with you how it ends. Um, to kind of set up verse 11, Jonah's upset because he goes to Nineveh, the enemy of his people, and he preaches to them and they repent and he's upset that the enemy of his people have repented and have started a right relationship with the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of their souls, the lover of their souls, the one who made them, who is intimate with them, now has plans and purpose for the enemy of God's people. And he's upset. And so God meets Jonah where he's at, and he sets up a little scheme, and he creates this tree to bloom, and a shade tree comes on him, and he provides shade for Jonah from the hot sun, and then God causes a, a little worm to eat the leaves of this tree, and then the hot sun begins to burn down on, on Jonah, and Jonah begins to get upset with God and says, God, why did you cause this worm to eat the leaves and cause me to sweat because I'm funky now? And God says, and can you go there? Chapter 4. 
And he goes, so why, this is God speaking, so why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? The big city, more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of all the innocent animals. God is saying to Jonah, listen, and if you read it from the King James, he says, why can't I change my mind about people who don't know their left from their right? So I'm a dad now, and I understand that people who don't know their left from their right are not grown-ups. Because if you're a grown-up and you don't know your left from your right, then you're not in your full faculties. Are we tracking? People who don't know their left from their right are? Children. Let's, let's try that one again. People who don't know their left from their right are? Children. Children, right? So in the message, it, it renders the idea that these people are childlike. They are not childish, meaning they know better. They just choose not to do better. They are childlike, meaning they don't know better. Right? So people post on social media sideways thought, not because they know better, but because they're like children. And you and I have the opportunity to lovingly have a conversation with them. But if we choose to, in our truth, in the wrong way, even though we're truthful, blow them out of the water. I mean, let me ask you a question. If you see a five-year-old right now doing something stupid, would you yell at them about the stupid thing they were doing? Or would you get down to their level and try to help them? There's a better way, right? So I'm all about calling sin, sin. I'm not talking about sugarcoating sin. That is not the message I'm saying. Sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. What I am saying is that children need adults who know better to love them enough to engage. That was great, Pastor David. And I, I want to I wanna clarify something before I, I, ask, I ask you a question. Because, you know, Pastor Steve has this in Proverbs, and Proverbs has a lot to say about engaging with certain types of people. Um, when I was making reference to being very careful, being humble, uh, I was, I was really trying to communicate that the world would love to say that the, everything's black and white, that there's two ways, you're either for us or you're against us. And there's this particular passage in scripture where the disciples found out that there was another group of people that were preaching in Christ's name and they weren't doing it like them. And they're like, Jesus, should we go stop them? And Jesus says, no, if they're not against us, they're for us. And that teaches me that's the way we should be thinking about situations. It's not that if you're not for me, you're against me, meaning there's two ways. It's actually saying, if you're not against me, then you're for me, which actually speaks to there being a real myriad of, of, of thoughts, that there's not one or two thoughts. There's not either for a movement or against a movement, for a people or against a people. There's not just racist or anti-racist. Those, th that's not what it is. The truth is, there's a whole lot more to people than we could possibly understand. So we should always come to the table from a very humble place, which is the way you would uh, approach a child. You can't look at a child saying, you know what I know, so I'll treat you like I treat myself. It's really more of a, I've got to come from a little softer place. Did you want to respond to that before I ask you a yeah, question? And I also want to say, it's not only that, but we should never assume to what you were saying that you were the first person or I'm the first person to engage that person. So let's say that I'm the first person to lovingly engage and you come on the scene. In the New Testament, there's this idea that, you know, one plants a seed, one waters, one reaps the harvest, right? So to what you're saying, if you're the one who plants the seed and you lovingly have planted that seed, right? And I come along and I don't lovingly support that seed, 
then I've just damaged the crop, right? But if I lovingly then come along and we don't have any relationship apart from Christ, like I'm not even in your zip code because of social media. Like I'm on, you know, somewhere else, another time zone, another continent, who knows? But I lovingly reflect Christ authentically. Then you, you plant the seed, I got to water. And then somebody else comes along and gets to reap the harvest, but God gets the glory. God gets the glory. So, man, we've been reading Proverbs every day, one chapter a day, all year long. We're going to finish all year long, 31 chapters. Most months have 31 days. So this is what our church is really trying to do. If you're not, we'd love for you to join us in it. It's been remarkable. The book of Proverbs makes tons of references to not wasting your voice on fools. Now, that, that principle seems to be at odds with what we're discussing tonight in the sense that it almost communicates a don't waste your breath. And I'll be honest, I am a 29-year-old. I lead from a position of, of some level of authority, but I also am recognizing more and more the limits to my understanding, not just because of my flesh, but because of my season of life. Being very mindful, there's a lot I have to learn. So even I have fallen under the temptation of that we should look at the, 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 those who don't get it with the Proverbs, the seemingly Proverbs truth of don't waste your voice. But I know, especially from a lot of our conversations, that that's probably not what Proverbs is trying to say and that there's, there's a way that these two truths can engage and both be truth. So what would you say to that? What would be the difference in looking at somebody who's childlike and looking from a place of wisdom saying, you know, I think they said a reproof is a thousand lashes to a fool. So how do we deal with all of that? Genuine question. Yeah, so I think this is where, so I'm going to, everyone here is a Christian, and if you're not, forgive me. I'm going to assume everyone under the sound of my voice tonight is in a God of relationship. And if you're not in a God of relationship tonight, this isn't for you. Ignore what I'm about to say. But if you're in a God of relationship, then you have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I make no equivocations that the Holy Spirit is real, active, alive, working, and moving in the world today. And so sometimes that tug in our spirit is real, and we ignore it to our own detriment. So when the prophet says, don't waste your breath on fools, I believe the Holy Spirit will tell you, don't post. Don't respond to that post. Don't respond to that post. Don't even post what you think you need to post right now. Don't. And you know what? You have your phone, and the Holy Spirit is working in you, and it's that little tug, and you're like, but man, I just want to hit that send because I want the likes. I want the hearts. I want the... I want the retweets. It's such a good tweet. If I can get I the retweets. The, that's good. I want the, yes, I want the, I want the validation. I want the affirmation. I'm being childish. Because I know better. Right? You're getting a lot of amens, Pastor David. I know it was good, but. I'm you know, not shocked by it. I'm not preaching, though. I'm just teaching. I'm not, I'm not shocked by it, but if you're I, getting a lot of amens. If I was preaching, then I would be like, you know, I'll be like Pastor Steve and be like, hey, that was good. You're preaching good, but I'm not, so I'm teaching. That's good. <laughs> you know, Pastor David, you, you and I on the phone, we talked a little bit about, I, I threw this at you. Um, conversations kind of beneath and behind conversations. So I, 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 you know, when you speak of looking at somebody who doesn't know better, they're childlike, getting down on their level. To some of us in the room, it's like, my parent has always told me not to get to that level, right? So there's almost like this conversation behind the conversation of like, getting on their level actually means I'm, I'm lowering myself to a place I shouldn't. Every one of us had some teacher or some preacher get on the platform and say, you know, try to pull me down, and I'm going to try to pull you up. And we all learn that it, you can't really take friends with you. As God takes you from glory to glory, you can't bring anybody with you. They have to be willing to come on their own. And it's got to be God's desire for them. So we've all learned that. But there is this truth to we are the only ones with the answers. And we're supposed to go 
throughout all the nations and, and bring these answers to people. So that would imply that there are moments where you may be casting your pearls before swine. So how do we engage them the way that you spoke of engaging your own daughter? How do we do that without lowering ourselves to their level to where we might be influenced by them? Because what I'm seeing today is a lot of people in, in hopes of aiding what's going on in the world actually becoming completely enveloped by it and, and like a rip current, wake up one day and find they're in a much different place than they actually desire to set out. So how, how do we balance that? So if you're taking notes, I will say this. There, there are three levels of relationship, okay? And uh, social media is not the devil. It's an interesting thing. It's the devil's son. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. Okay. From a business perspective, and so uh, I used to be on staff at the church, and I loved it. It was great. It was fantastic. But can I tell you something? Uh, you don't get paid as a pastor. So pray for your pastors. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so serious. Pray for Pastor Steve. Pray for Pastor Mary. Um, what they do, they do in faith. Pray for Pastor Chris, because what you do, you do in faith. And I don't want to... I want you to hear my heart. I, I'm not working at the church right now because I was, I was chasing a paycheck. Um, but I feel like God was calling me to grow my bank account because I want to do some other things in the kingdom. Yeah. And there's some other things I want to do in the kingdom that require more resources, all right? So three levels of relationship, right? So you have intimate relationships. These are real relationships. These are your family, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, Right? These are your first-line conversations. These are the people that if they are not in a God of relationship, it should break your heart every morning to the point that when you wake up, you know, the first thing you should want to do before you eat breakfast is pray for them and you plead the blood for them. And it should hurt so much that they are not going to heaven with you that you pray and fast for them. And one day out of the week, maybe that's Sunday, you say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast half a day. I'm going to come to church, and I'm just going to fast on their behalf until one day they accept Jesus as their Savior because I am knocking on heaven's door to get the attention of powers and principalities to get them to the doors of Metro Life Church if they're in South Florida or wherever they are, if they're in Texas. I need to get them somewhere, and I'm going to sacrifice a meal I'm going to sacrifice a seed. I'm going to do something to capture heaven's attention on their behalf because they need to get to heaven with me. All right? And if you're not willing to do that for mom and dad who don't know Jesus, I don't know what to tell you. Check your salvation. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this isn't for you. I'm so passionate about this. I, 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 I have conversations with people who, who, who say they're Christian and it doesn't break their heart that their little baby sister or their big brother is not going to heaven. And I want to curse at them with a righteous anger. I, like it boils my blood to say that you, you're, you're, can, I, can I have dinner with you tonight? Can you invite me over to your house so that I can have the conversation with your little sister so that they can go to heaven with you? First level of relationship. I'm sorry. All right? Sec sorry. Second level of relationship. Right? And, and this, I learned relationship, relationship, relationship. Uh, three levels. I hope you picked up on this, right? Wow. wow. Right. Second level of relationship. Ready? Second level of relationship. People you see every day. Could be the, the coffee, the person you buy coffee from. Could be the teacher you see every day. Could be the, the coworker. Could be the, the parking attendant that you pay the, the little quarter to to get you into your parking lot. It could be the valet. The, the people you see every day. If you see their face enough to know what they look like and you don't know their name, you are a bad Christian. Did I shame you? Yes. Am I doing it on purpose? Yes. I'm looking at everybody equally to shame everybody equally. <laughs> but listen, listen, I'm so serious about this. If you, see every, if you see the same person every day and you don't know their name, 
and they know your name because you get the same chai tea latte, that is messed up. That is messed up. So that second level of relationship, you know, it should, it should start to, like, permeate you that, man, you should start praying the prayer, God, can you start something where I can have a conversation with them? Can you, can you cause a situation where I can be a blessing in their life? Uh, can you cause a flat tire that I can go and help change their tire? Uh, can you, I'm just, you know, just saying, uh, dead battery that I can be the person that has a jumper cable, something. Cause a situation where I can just have the in to start the conversation, to be more than just the coffee guy or the coffee gal. Second level relationship, all right? Third level of relationship. And this I learned from business. But there is this thing called an algorithm. And if you're on social media, you see the people who pop up in your algorithm. These are third level relationships. People who follow you, people who you influence, people who just show up and like everything you post. And I think you have a certain level of responsibility to them. And so to what you were saying, how do we not get down to their level? I think the Holy Spirit brings people into our world. We, when we start searching for conversations, that's when we're going down. I don't think we need to search for people. I really think the Holy Spirit brings people into our world. But when we start searching for the interaction, that's when we kind of like get into trouble. Don't search for the interaction. I guarantee you, you have enough people in your world. And if you are... If, you, if, if everyone in your first level is saved and everybody in your second level is saved, then just start seeing who's liking all your posts. I say, I'm going to church on Sunday. And if they like that uh, and you've never interacted with them, then why not say, hey, man, are you in Miami? Because you should come to Metro Life. I'd love to meet you. you. You like everything I like. Maybe you're a stalker. I don't know. but so. Well, You know, we're gonna we're going to uh, we're gonna end pretty soon. And I think what I'm gonna ask is that if anyone has any questions, DM the Instagram account, and maybe next week we can do a video or something and send it out there so people can get answers to the questions that they may have. Um, or maybe we do something like this again. But um, you know, Pastor David, my my world has been rocked recently. I have been I have been really wanting to get things right. I, I have really wanted to make sure that I'm not part of the problem. Um, my wife and I talk all the time. And I'm constantly wanting, I'm so passionate about wanting to be part of the solution that I'm deathly afraid of becoming part of the problem. So for instance, I have things to say about everything. I can't help it. I... I'm not the person who wants to fight somebody on social media because my dad actually taught me when I was nine years old and he started to realize I probably wasn't going to be all that strong and he could just project my future and be like, he ain't going to win fights. He started to tell me, win with your words. So I've gotten really good at that. So I always feel like I can present things in a way where there's like no way you can come back at me. But I realize that whenever I do that, thinking I'm helping, Sometimes I'm sowing into a world that somehow believes they can find the full truth on social media. And I don't know if that's a good thing to sow into. I think I, I've really struggled with when the Lord is moving my heart, what to do with what he's moved. When he shares something with me, when he, you know, when I'm reading and I, I feel like the Lord's revealed something, and especially if it ties to something that's going on in the world or something that I know is of dialogue in the kind of public narrative. But lately I've been like, I think it's better, it's less of a risk to keep my mouth shut and to, to use the platform, the real platform that God has given me. Because the truth is no one has a platform on social media because no one has a platform if everyone has a platform. It's kind of like the Incredibles. Like, if everyone's super, no one is. So no one has platforms anymore. And whenever we post something, it's immediately skipped to what the other person says. So I've 
really been trying to get things right. Well, one of the things that has come across my eyes and my spirit lately is that the term that people are like, I have to show them Jesus in my actions, right? And this guy, this guy I happen to follow on social media made a statement, and I know what I'm about to say may fly in the face of, of my desire to not pour into social media, but he ended up really, really, really speaking something into my heart. He, he labeled what the gospel is. He said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is God, the creator of all things, decided to put on flesh and die on the cross for your sins, putting every one of our sins on his back, taking them to death, hell, and the grave, taking the keys of hell, that whoever believes in him, they will not perish, but they will have eternal life with him. That's the gospel. And you don't show somebody that, you have to tell them. You can't show someone that in your actions. You literally have to have the conversation. And I don't necessarily know if I fully believe that as much as I think we've got to be careful that we don't say, well, I will just show them and use that as an excuse to never have to tell them. I have gotten caught up in this. I remember good hearted people telling me, well, you know what? Just love them and just show them. But when I see your passion and I, I've known you a long time. You don't see that on Pastor David about a whole lot of stuff. We'll be like, hey, let's talk sports. You don't get any of that from Pastor David. So when that, when that comes out, it's genuine passion. And to think that we would have the keys, and, and, and y'all, it's not, it's not a simple enough truth to say, like, heaven is just the next life, and they don't get a next life, but we do. That's real religion and cultish. We're talking about, when we say we're going to heaven, we are talking about being reunited with the creator of all things, the perfecter of our faith, the God who put on flesh and died for us. Being reunited with him, and whoever is not is separated from him. So when you understand that that's what's going on, people that don't know Jesus, you're like, I don't want you separated from him, but for two reasons. Because this is one of the things that we've, failed to realize in our generation across the board. We've become so enamored with the love of God, so enamored with the love of God, and we've taken the love of God into so many rabbit holes and <laughs> rabbit trails that now we believe that wearing a mask is loving your neighbor. And that is so wrong to do because the Bible didn't say it, so I can't say it did. We, <laughs> so now I'm getting passionate. We have to, we have to, recognize as much as we're getting caught up in God's love and we're taking it too far, the revelation that I am loved by the perfect God, that, that, that this God did this for me out of his love and grace for me, my first response has to then be when I've realized his love for me, it has to be to look to the person next to me and say, my job now becomes making sure you know that love too. Not showing you that love, because there's not a person in this room capable of showing another human being God's unconditional love. We're not capable of it. But doing my best to not take away from it with my actions and making sure I tell them, because if I've just walked into this revelation that this perfect God loves me so much, I have to also realize he loves that person so much. And his heart is broken that they don't know that. So if I love him because he loves me, then I don't want his heart broken. Now, when you take that little love triangle into every scenario known to man, every, uh, what do they call them when you have to go in school and they want you to do a current event? When you look at every current event, when you recognize that while all of his children are fighting over who's right and who's wrong, there's a perfect God in heaven who's heartbroken that his children don't know of his love for them. When you recognize that, that passion supersedes any desire to win a social media argument. It immediately pulls the rug out from underneath 
all of these movements that are trying to redefine some level of truth. And I'm talking about all of them. Because when I realize that the God who's trying so stinking hard to show me his love for me, that he would literally put on flesh and feel my pain for me, when I realize that he did that for them too, why would I, why would I waste any time on earth fighting over something that's not eternal when we have the keys to something eternal? So, you know, it's really only 9.15. We don't have to be done soon. We normally like to be done around this time. But tell me this, Pastor David. It was the first question we asked. We've said a lot about it. But it's been really hard for this room, for this group of people, for myself, to know what to do, what to think, how to respond over the last year. It's been really, really hard. We have been bombarded by people clamoring for our attention in ways that I don't think any other generation has. What would you say, as someone who's got a little bit more experience, what would you say when it comes to us? One more time, kind of wrap this all up for us. How should we engage with all that? So I'm going to end on a very positive note. Thank God. But I'm also going to end on a very practical one as well. You're never going to be... Let me, let me, let me and hear my heart. You're never going to be as appreciated on a tweet or on an Instagram post as you are sitting across the table from someone. Never. Because in the art of having a real conversation, there is this amazing thing called body language and chemistry. Mm. And these things are lost when we tweet and when we post on social media. So even if you, 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 you post a banging TikTok video or Instagram live, like it's going to be lost. And what is sad and, you know, I, <laughs> I'm going to say for you guys, because honestly, uh, I, I experienced dial-up uh, internet. So if you experience dial-up internet, you're of a different generation. <laughs> Your brain's just different. Your brain is different. Yeah, my, my relationship with internet is very different than if you've never experienced dial-up. The instant, like, like, just to, to date myself, okay? The number I have on my cell phone is the number I had on my beeper. And if you don't know what a beeper is, then we're just of a different generation. You know, I remember getting a Palm Pilot. All right, there you go. See, I had one of those. They were cool for like six months, and then the mm -hmm. iPad came yeah, out, and it was all over. There is, there is this thing called nuance, and it is completely lost in social media. And what is, what is sad is that the people who move the needle of culture fail to realize. And the problem is the people who move the needle of culture are younger than you. And they don't understand this simple truth that the art of conversation is an art. It is something that you have to labor for, to actually engage. When we look at like, and, and not to get like out there, but just look at the founding documents of this nation, right? These were written by men who labored over a word's significance. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And they fought over that line for weeks. Do we hold these truths to be self-evident? Can we argue a truth? Is a truth self-evident? This was the debate that was happening in this thing called the Continental Congress. And they were like fighting over words, individual words. And we grab our phones and we throw a tweet out and we, hey, we just throw it out there without thought or regards to where it lands. And then we have people who criticize things that took months to create. Literature. We compare tweets 
to literature. This is the world we live in. This is the world you live in. So, Pastor Chris, it's sad and it's dangerous because you'll, 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 you'll throw a joke out, you'll throw a meme out, and you'll think it's hilarious, and the 20-year-old you and your boys or your girls will think that's hilarious. That, that, that meme was fantastically funny because it just captured the moment of the weekend you were just in but then 35 year old you will get canceled because that tweet has no nuance and no context and no understanding but you're up for a job or a promotion and someone's going to search your history and find that thing you did when you were 20 years old and say that you have no significance or value because of something you did when you were 20 or worse because now Kids are jumping on Twitter when they're 13 or 14. Like I, I told my wife, my kids aren't, aren't getting on Twitter until they're like 22. I'm so serious. I hope it's not a thing when they're 22. I, we I, just like... Yeah. Well, if we all just say, we'll get... Like, so if you, if, if you... Like, I'm on social media, but if you look, I haven't posted like in a year and a half. And it's not because I'm scared of being canceled. It's just like, what am I going to say? When I, when, I, when I was on staff at the church, I would, like, I, would, I would promote things going on in church, and I would post Bible verses and, 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 and try to be uplifting and, and motivational. But honestly, it was like when I, when I stopped being here, it was like I didn't – it's not that I didn't have the energy. It's just I just didn't – I didn't want to engage because of all the haters. Back then. Back then. So I will say this. When you engage – Make sure it's with people that you love and you want to invest your energy into. Because if it's not, then don't. Yeah. You know, Pastor David, I'm sure if we were to ask every single person in, the, in this room what their favorite instrument is, not one person would say bagpipes. Not one. They're loud. They're noisy. They're like, they're insane. They look weird. You've heard some people play them better than others, but they're still bagpipes. And that's social media. It's loud, it's noisy, it's ugly. Yeah, some people do it better than others, but it's still bagpipes. And that form of communication, it's not communication. It's not and there are really smart people who find really smart ways to try to convince us that social media is a really smart tool. But we should really, really, really take uh, care and think about what we're thinking about, you know, when the very people who created it don't let their kids be on it. That's when we should recognize, you know, it might not be the most spiritual thing in the world to say, hey, let's end this by saying get off of social media. But truth be told, if, if, if the guy who made the Burger King burger wouldn't put it in his, wouldn't eat it, we should all be like, well, something's up. If the doctor these days with the vaccine was like, you should get the vaccine. Uh, now, I'm not going to, but I think you should. We would all be like, do me a favor. Give me some vitamins and let me go home. But I'll say this. So here's what you can do with social media that I'm so, like, inspired by. You can message in ways that can transform the world. So we are believers in Christ, and I believe we have this, the most powerful, most amazing message in the world. And if you can find a way to message about faith and hope and love, then do it. So my wife and I, we, what we, what we, when we do message, we message about adoption and about foster care. And so we have a network of, of people that reach out to us and, and we, we talk about faith for family and we talk about this idea of maybe being led by God to, to, to foster, to adopt. And if it wasn't for our experience and if it wasn't for social media, we wouldn't be in contact. So this past year, we've connected like six different people with uh, a lawyer that's helped them uh, navigate the Dade County foster care system, and, and three of those six people will be closing on adoptions at the end of the summer. But yeah, you can clap, because that's awesome. 
So we don't brag about that because honestly, we're not like, it's not a business that we're doing. It's just living our life and something that's relevant and powerful in our, in our world. And using a tool. And using a tool. And that's what social media should be. If you're using it as a tool, then it's powerful. But if you're using it for vanity, then it's ridiculous. This is really good, Pastor David. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Let's segue into the next hour and a half conversation about, um, why are you laughing? I'm just kidding. Uh, for real, thank you for being here. I think you've given us a lot to really chew on. And I, I hope that, that these dialogues don't end. I hope you go home and you talk about these things on the drive home. I hope you continue to converse about it. I hope that, that you get into the word for yourself and you develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit so he can speak and he can say, don't post that post this. I'm very lucky because if I can't hear the Holy Spirit, I definitely hear my wife and we're good to go and I don't make the mistake and don't post it. But we really, we really do encourage you to, to keep doing what you're doing. And maybe, you know what, maybe like, like, like Pastor David said, the three different realms of relationship. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of people in your first two. Well, maybe that's why you need to be in a connect group. Maybe that's why you do need to say, all right, you know what, I love the preaching and all that. That's great. I'll get that on Sunday but I'm going to get into a connect group because, you know, it was the most beautiful thing. Rochelle and I yesterday were in the, the lobby at the end of the service, just talking to this, this single mom and a friend that she met at Metro. Neither, neither of them knew each other. They just happened to meet, but their lives almost have played out the exact same way. And as we were just talking about life, they kept going, <gasps> we learned that in bait of Satan. <gasps> we learned that in bait of Satan. And they're like, we need to get into this next connect group. And I'm like, I, I, when, when Rochelle and I were talking to these people, what connected us was the connect group. What gave them something to add to that conversation was their connect group. So maybe you're like, you know what, I need to, to grow that first or second group. Well, guys, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Because you know what? Genuine relationship goes way farther than just one random night in church. And so we really encourage you Stay close to Metro Life Church. Serve here. Serve here. Be in a connect group. Connect here. We don't give you five minutes to get coffee and normally 10 because we think at 8.30, everybody actually wants coffee. We do it because it's one of the only opportunities to actually meet some of the people that are sitting around you for months. So we really hope you take this and you make this much more than just two guys having a dialogue tonight. I hope that you take this home, you talk to the Lord about it, you talk to your family about it, you talk to your friends about it, and you continue the conversation. Pastor David, would you just end this, end this by praying for us tonight? Sure. Hey, can I ask you guys to do something? Can you stand up? Uh, I'm actually not going to pray. I know you guys, do you do the closing benediction here? You do it? Can I do that? You absolutely can. All right, listen. We do this in, in Sunday service, and uh, I, I, I've seen you guys. You don't appreciate this. So I'm going to do this, and I want you guys to learn to appreciate this. Um, the closing benediction in any church is a powerful moment, and it's a spiritual moment. So I'm going to ask whoever's on the keys uh, to play some spiritual music, right? There you go. That's good. Because it sets the atmosphere. Um, when, we, when, when the pastor, whoever it is, speaks this closing benediction over you, it's not just because we want to close the service and this is a snappy, catchy way to close the service. It is part of the art of the relationship we have in the service. The art of the relationship we have in the service is that we come to church and we worship a living and vibrant God who is active and moving. And we give him all the praise and glory and adoration because he is worthy to receive it. And after we worship him, we allow our pastor, our shepherd, who spent time in the presence of God to speak a word that is going to be relevant and powerful to our soul. It is bread to our spirit. 
because our spirit is hungry after a week of being outside of the presence of God. So we've given God our best worship and praise, and now we're in his presence, and he's come and he's he's inhabited the space that we've created. The atmosphere is set, and we're eating a meal with him that our pastor, our shepherd, is serving. And we hear this word. And can I tell you, I have a notebook in church. Some of the best ideas I have don't come in the shower. They come in the sanctuary. And in response to the blessings that the Holy Spirit has given me of great ideas to to speak over my parents' lives and over my children's lives and over my wife's lives, I sow an offering. Because what else can I do? The Holy Spirit literally has dropped nuggets into my spirit inside of a Sunday service that have wrecked my family life for the better. And so I give my tithes, but sometimes it's like, gosh, I wish I could curse in church. I got to serve and sow an offering. And I do. And it would be great if that was it. But then the pastor stands in front and, and, and we do this, and every church does something different. And every church has a different closing, and we call it a benediction. Every church does something different. Our church has chosen Numbers chapter 6. This is a priestly benediction, and it's powerful. I don't think it's coincidence. I don't think you understand what this is. This is the blessing that was spoken by the head priest to all of the other priests of the nation. So that they could then in turn go and serve in their capacity as priests. So when Pastor Steve or Pastor Chris or the worship leaders stand up and speak this over you, it is actually a gift to you. And if you don't receive it as a gift, you're missing out. You are missing out. Because what this is saying the Lord bless you this week is going to suck Monday is going to come you're going to get a flat tire you're going to run out of gas something's going to happen but the Lord is going to bless you the Lord is going to keep you the Lord is going to make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord is going to turn his face towards you and give you peace This is a gift. This is not a parting gift. This is a gift to set your week on fire. And so it's Monday. You get a double blessing because if you're here on Sunday, you got it and you're going to get it again. So I'm going to invite you to do something. This is something that I do. When Pastor Chris or Pastor Steve or any of the other pastors speak this, I put my hands out like I'm getting something. So I'm going to invite you to just put your hands out like you're getting something. This is a gift. This is God's gift that your pastor has decided to speak into your world, into the atmosphere of your life, to your family's life. And I'm going to speak it to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. To you too. And that is the gift that you give back to your pastor or your preacher, whoever closed out service. And I say thank you because I appreciate that. God bless you guys.